Hello, 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 and welcome to this video on effective online courses. One of the things I think that's been the most obvious since we've gone into lockdown is the switch many people have had to make from doing live training and live consulting and live coaching to doing more and more online, including, of course, creating online courses. And I think obviously that's going to continue beyond lockdown because it gives people the opportunity to earn without investing so much of their time um, per client, as it were. Um, that said, it seems to me that what most people have been focusing on when it comes to online courses is either the basics of how do we make them and what technology can we use and stuff like that, or how do we sell them, how do we market them, how do we get people to buy them. And we've had very little focus from the people who switch to them on how do we actually make them effective. So in other words, how do we make sure people actually learn from them and people can get results from them and those results are sustained. Now that's something that in the, on, in the live training world, um, there's been a kind of a body of knowledge built up um, over yet many, many years, but many of us who are new to doing courses but, and are doing it effectively because of lockdown are kind of missing out on that body of knowledge. So today I have with me Antoinette Oglethorpe. Um, Antoinette and I have known each other for a long, long time. And one of the things that Antoinette has always been incredibly well regarded for is the level of interaction and engagement and results she gets from her live courses. Um, they're not just the normal little kind of exercises you do, etc. but she really makes sure that the attendees really engage and really get results when they come out of the end of the course. And those results are sustained over the long term. And now, of course, she's turning that to online courses as well. And it already started on that path well before lockdown. So what we're going to talk today about is how do you make your online courses more effective? How do you make sure people get results from them? So welcome, Antoinette. Thank you, Ian. It's lovely to be here with you. Brilliant. So first, first of all, really broad question, first of all, what is it that makes an online course or any course, I guess, get results? What makes sure that people who've come on that course can actually turn it into results in the real world? What are the, the big levers or key factors? So I think the big thing um, with the kind of online courses that we're talking about, or the kind of training courses mm. we're talking about, is it's not just about acquiring knowledge. And it's not just about acquiring information. What we want is people to change their behavior mm. as a result of the course they're attending and to take action. Mm. So there's lots of principles of behavior change that really need to come into things to make it very practical and for people to take the steps that they need to take. And one of the, so, you know, starting with the end in mind, mm -hmm. the key thing that people need to be thinking about when they're designing their courses is what actions or what behaviours do I want people to implement as a result of this training? So does that mean, for example, rather than, I guess if you were being simplistic about it and you're thinking, I'm going to develop an online training course, I'm an expert in topic X, you might list all the things you want people to, to know, or you take all the knowledge in your head and dump it out, make a list, oh, they need to know this and this and this and this and this. And you're suggesting rather than focusing on what people need to know, you should start by focusing on what kind of behavior changes you, you want them to make as a result of the course that is going to lead to some better result in their in their in their working lives or their personal lives afterwards. Yes, exactly. And so then you can work back from that, that mm -hmm. if I want them to take this action. So um, if I take one of you know, let's say that I want them to be able to run a webinar. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know that they're going to be able to run a webinar? Well, they'll identify what the learning outcomes are. They'll identify what platform they're going to use. They're going to identify what time they're going to schedule it. There's all these um, visible signs that mm -hmm. they can do what you want them to do. And that will then dictate what information you need to give them in order to pass that on. So rather than starting with all your body of knowledge... And, you know, someone like you teaching marketing, you've got you know, decades of experience. It must make it really hard to think, oh, my goodness, if you really focus it in on the action that you want them to take and how you know that they can take that action, it just funnels it right down to the critical elements. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably key, isn't it? Because those of us who are doing creating the courses i suspect many of us are kind of in love with our topic by now that's why we're still in that in that field many many years later why we've acquired all this knowledge 
So I think there's often a tendency to assume that everyone else is in love with the topic and therefore your job is to teach them as much as you can about that topic because they love it too. Whereas the reality is in business or in life, most people learning something are not are not necessarily learning it for the love of learning it. They're learning it because they want to do something as a result. Now, of course, some people are going to be learning it. I mean, I, um, if I, I'm thinking some of the things that I've bought in the past, like the, the famous masterclass courses. So I bought a masterclass from Aaron Sorkin, or, or Sorkin on, on kind of script writing and screenplays. And I'm not really going to do anything with that. It's more for enjoyment and entertainment and just wanting to learn. And of course, there's a couple of things I can pick from that and have maybe influenced me. But the main thing was just learning for learning's sake. But that's not true of most things we get courses or most things we want to get a result from. Um, and so if you try and splurge everything you know to them, most of it's irrelevant to them. They don't need to know everything in order to be able to get a result. Um, mm. And I think that's definitely the case that, you know, when I've bought courses that I've really struggled to get through, it's often because it's like hour after hour of pre-recorded sessions where they're just sharing everything they know about a certain topic rather than what I need to know in order to be able to do something with it. So that's the first step then is to focus on what they, what behavior change you're looking for and therefore what they need to know um, in order to, to make that behavior change. So that would be your first step in doing a course is to, is to look at the behavior changes. What what would you what would you look at next if you in terms of getting results from a course? So the key thing is to make it quite is to break it down into mm -hmm. small actions and also bite sized uh, recordings and such like. So not hours upon mm -hmm. hours upon hours, but actually breaking it down into you know a small amount of input, just the amount of input they need in order to demonstrate that they've learnt the key thing they need to learn in order to take the action and making the action as small as possible. So I don't know if you've heard of a gentleman called BJ Fogg at Stanford yeah. University. Yeah, so that whole concept of tiny habits mm -hmm. and the whole theory behind that is that anything that is too big to do just takes too much effort, too much motivation and too much skill and therefore people are paralysed and they're not going to take it. Whereas if you make something really, really small, it makes it you know, really, really easy, then actually it's, it's not too hard. There's not too many barriers in the way for them to do it. And I suppose that's exaggerated with online courses because in a, in a live course you can kind of force them <laughs> to, to keep going through and and they, they, you know, unless they walk out of the room they're kind of forced to listen to the next step and to do the next exercise. But with an online course they they they're just clicking over and reading email or switching it off etc. So I think that's po probably one of the things to bear in mind for an online course is it's it is really discretionary. This is even even if someone has bought a course for someone else or they're supposed to do it for their job it's very easy to to just put it off and not do it and to have lots of excuses why either to yourself or to your boss as to why you couldn't complete it that you wouldn't have live so it, it even more so you've got to break things down into little easy manageable chunks and and what what's I, think, I think there's a point to to mention there on what we mean by online courses mm. because I think um, obviously it's a term that's being used all the time at the moment and there are as many different kinds of online that's course true. as there are face to face course and I think when people are talking about online courses one person's talking about the equivalent of a university lecture another person's talking about the equivalent of a Udemy course mm. and the two are completely different mm. so one thing to bear in mind one difference between online training that you don't get in face to face is you get synchronous and you get asynchronous mm -hmm. so synchronous online learning is like a live webinar right um or like a live online workshop and certainly in terms of moving to online training my clients want that step to be as small as possible and as close to what they're used to in face-to-face -face as possible. One of the reasons being what you've just said is they feel that people have to be sat in front of an instructor in order to be led through right. a program and haven't got the motivation or inclination to do it in their own time. Okay. So depending on your audience 
when you're designing these online training, you need to think about that. Is okay. it asynchronous or is it synchronous? And especially if you are, if your audience is an organisation that's buying a course for its employees, there could well be a strong tendency for them to want a live, a synchronous component to it at least, or it all to be synchronous because of that fear that people will just put a put an async course to one side and not do it. Okay, so that's that's definitely worth bearing in mind um, as you're thinking of, especially for your first courses, if you're thinking, well, where's the first place for me to go as a course? It's going to be easier for you as well to take what you were doing live and turn it into a live experience over the web. The only thing I guess that's more, more difficult is the technology in that you're, there may be a fear that the tech will let you down because the webinar platform will fail or whatever that you maybe don't get if you get the chance to re-record a video a few times. But other than that, it's less of a step to doing all the recording and then having it up on a website. You, know, you can just do it on a, on a webinar platform and that's the only thing you have to learn. Yeah, exactly. And once you've done it that way, you know what the energy levels are, you know how the timing works, and that makes it a lot easier to then chunk it down to right. move online. So you can so, spot when people are, are beginning to fade and or when we, we've got to have a break or an exercise there, for example. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, haven't, I have never designed an online, an asynchronous online course from a blank sheet of paper. Mm. I've always had a live program that I could then chunk down and know where, well, we'd have an activity there, right? So, you know, we break it there. Um, and, so even if, and even if you were doing one from scratch, you'd probably still do it live first online in a synchronous manner to learn from that, to know how to chunk it up and to know where you need some extra work and to know what, you know, what's working really well. Yeah, yeah, Excellent. absolutely. And so if we, if we look at, I mean, feel free to answer from both those perspectives of a synchronous course or an, an asynchronous course. So you, if you've split your course up and you've got it into little chunks, what does a chunk look like, an individual chunk? Is it a, kind of a bit of a bit of learning, a bit of kind of, you know, spouting knowledge and then they do something? How do you how do you construct the actual individual little section? So if I was if I was live, we try mm -hmm. and get the learning from the participants and then summarize with the facts rather than starting with the facts ah. and then getting them to do something. So if I give you an example, so my my company specializes in career conversations and mentoring. And so we train managers to have career conversations. So when we're teaching the characteristics of effective career conversations, we could just give a list of five things and say, well, it's this, it's this, it's this, this. We don't, we get them to do an activity where they describe their best conversation right. that impacted their career. Now, if the various ways we do that are if we were live in person or live online, we put them into breakouts, ask each of them to share their story in turn, and then as a group, they identify the themes. If we're on an asynchronous platform, we get each of them to describe their story, so they type it in, yeah. and then we ask them to read at least two other people's stories and identify the themes that they see coming through. Um, or we also get them to share their stories, and then when we come together in a live online session as part of that whole packet, blended package, mm. we would have that discussion. So no matter what type of platform you're using on what type of thing, you're trying to construct a way there of both them reflecting on their own experiences, which is going to kind of, I guess, activate them and be, make them more ready to learn new stuff because they, they're able to connect it to their own experiences. But also you're trying to get sharing. Even in an asynchronous environment, you'd be trying to use a platform where people could share not not you know not live but one person would post something up another person would notice it etc and i guess if you've got different people going through the courses over time you know they can see what someone six months ago posted about their their experiences and learn from that as well yeah i mean again it depends how you structure that i mean when we do our asynchronous we still do them in cohorts right. so we we copy the course every time and so it's the july 2020 course has eight people on it um, next time we run it, 
they won't see those eight people, they'll start again and there'll be a new cohort going through it. And, and one of the reasons for that is because, you know, the power of learning from each other mm. and sharing of experiences. And so one of the things we're trying to do, even though they only meet once a week, is build a community. Mm. Um, and so on the asynchronous platform, we had to really think about that because normally you'd all be in a room, you'd go, yeah. oh, Ian, hi, where do you live? And you'd have all that chit chat. On a platform, you've got to do that in other ways. Um, and I am a, I hate icebreakers, by yeah. the way, in live <laughs> workshops. Yeah. But suddenly I'm back into, okay, how do we break the ice yeah. in this platform? And so you're constructing an icebreaker. So, so if you're, um... So you're deliberately building exercises or, or something into the into the agenda of the course just to get people to be, begin to build a relationship with the other people on the course so that they can learn from them better because they're gonna the, the more they know them, the more they feel comfortable with them, the more they're gonna be able to share and learn from others as opposed to kind of ignoring what everyone else is doing. So can you give us some examples of some of the ways you might do that in terms of building the relationships between people on the course? So on the, on the platform, the, um, the whole of the kind of intro bit, we really bulked that up. Um, we asked people to make sure that they added photos to their profiles. Mm -hmm. um, when we've used it in-house, I've, yeah, I've not worried about that. They know what each other looks like. Yeah. Um, but we get them to add profiles. We got them to share their LinkedIn profiles and encourage them to connect um, we we ask them to introduce themselves and say a bit about who they are and what they do. We ask them to share um, qu a quote that was meaningful to them for um, career conversations. L and D people love a good quote. Um, <laughs> uh, and again, you know, they had to explain why that resonated with right. them. So it's a bit more, bit more personal. Um, and then we our program is a blended program so we did actually then come together live um, but what we did there was we kept it very content free so um, it was we didn't have slides it was like okay we're just screens and we're just getting to know each other um, and and so we made that part of the course as well so the intro took quite a long time actually and I would allow more time for it these so more, more than even more so than you would live, you've kind of over invested in the intro because it's going to be the stuff that would happen without you even knowing it in the breaks and before they met when they're having coffees. That's not going to happen online. So you've got to plan it into the course itself. Yeah. Yeah. OK, super. So we've got we've got the getting the intros, getting people able to learn from each other. You've, you've got it split up. And that all came from you saying instead of talk, ac talk activity, you've got get them to talk first, get them to share first, then you summarise and feedback your experience, etc. And then presumably there's some kind of action in each module that you're expecting them to do um, that will take them further and embed the learning or get them to do something back in their business as well, get them to take action. Yeah, so we have, you know, each video is less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then there is, you know, we ask them at the end of the video, we ask them to reflect and comment. So um, we want them to comment on what they've heard um, so that they can start a discussion about it. And then there will be an activity to put that into practice. Um, but one of the things that was really important to us was to have interaction on the portal. And that's mm. why we set that tone really early on you know, comment, uh, you know, react to each other's comments, you know, make your own observations. Um, and just like in a classroom, if we're with people, we get people's voices heard really on, early on. Because and you push that a bit, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise they get into the habit of, oh, great, I'm just going to sit here and, um, and listen. Mm. And once they're in that mindset, if you then, you know, an hour later say, right, OK, now we're going to have a group discussion. They go, what? You <laughs> just, know? Well, yeah, they were not like, expect. Not, not just they weren't you know? expecting it. They're just not, they're not in the right mode. They're not in the right mood for it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The, um, obviously, as you know, I've, I've written quite a lot about email marketing. And there's a very similar thing there. If you educate people in your first half a dozen emails to never respond, to just passively read, then if you eventually want them to take action, like to click and buy something, 
or they just don't do it. But if you get them even just to reply and say hello or tell you what their problem is or to even just click a button and you know pick an option, then they're, they're just used to taking action. It's a bit like the difference in mindset. If you get an, a, an email from your, from your better half, the mindset you're reading that email is, I'm probably going to have to do something as a result of this. Whereas if typically you get an email, many of the newsletter type emails, your mindset is either I don't have to read this now, I'm, I could just read it and I don't have to do anything. You just not. It, it's it's almost a shock by the time you get to the end and you're expected to do something. And it sounds like it's the same with a with a course. If you've not yeah. been expected to do anything so far, you've never interacted. It's too much of a jolt later on. So you've got to get them interacting early. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you'll deliberately do that with the intros and the exercises that you do. That that makes sure that later on, when you give them an action to do, they're kind of more used to doing. And I'm guessing in the, the very first actions you get ask them to do are kind of maybe simpler and and less of a stretch for them, so that they they get into the habit. So be, by the time you ask them to do something big, they're used to taking action. Yeah, absolutely. So whether it's you know on the asynchronous platform or in a webinar you'll get them to type something into the chat box or answer a poll in a live online session you'll get them to introduce themselves i mean it is as simple as just introducing themselves mm. everyone knows the, their name and what they do that's for, so um yeah it's um yeah whatever whatever way you want them to interact getting them to do that early on when we're doing live online we do actually say, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Tell us why you're here and all that kind of stuff. And so when it comes to the kind of actions and tasks you ask them to do after they've learned something, can you tell us about what, what they look like? What kind of things do you ask people to do that are, that are the best to help embed the learning and to get them to, to change behaviour at the end of the day? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a challenge for us because our, as I say, our skills are about conversations so we want them to go and practice having conversations. And when everyone's locked down and at home with their family, if their choice of a person to practice having a career conversation with is a four year old, then that's <laughs> not, not really <laughs> that's not really ideal. Um, so uh, what I would like to do, but I, I'll be honest, I haven't been brave enough yet, is to pair them up um, and get them to work together outside in terms of having those practices. Um, but actually our clients have been so oh my god we're so busy I just thought oh that's not going to go down <laughs> very well if I asked them to do that um, but we asked them to go and, have, uh, and practice having the conversation practice asking this question you know in terms of keeping it small practice asking this question your husband your friend your you know teenage son um, whoever it might be an employee um, if you want to um, and then and then comment in the portal as to how it went yeah, what did you try? Okay, so the, so the, it's important that the, 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 the in a way, you, you, we, it's interesting, as you've been, we've been going through, you've always called these actions rather than exercises. Sometimes in courses, we call them exercises, but an exercise sounds like academic and writing something down. An action, in this case, you're going out in the real world and doing something. So, and again, it's, it's um, conditioning them to expect to, to do something rather than just to sit quietly by themselves and make notes, etc., Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it'll be reflection. So um, because we're asking them to have career conversations with others, we ask them to reflect on their own career. Mm. So that might be a little bit more of an uh, exercise mm. in that think back over the last six months of your career or think back over the three months of lockdown. You know, what have you enjoyed? What have you hated? What has surprised you? Um, and then, yeah, we get them to plot a timeline um, and and the, and develop some insights and some self-awareness from that. So that's a bit more of a reflective exercise. So um, there is a, a concept called, <clears throat> called multiple intelligences, where basically people learn through multiple intelligences. Some are intrapersonal, i.e. reflecting on your own. Some are interpersonal through engaging and discussing with others. Some might be mathematical. So you might ask somebody to come up with a list of um, seven characteristics, seven effective conversation. Um, some of them might be physical. So we actually do encourage people to get up and go and phone somebody and have a conversation so that they're moving around and changing their physicality. 
Um, so using those multiple intelligence can be a great way to design these kind of actions and activities so that you gain variety. Because one of the challenges with online courses is the fact, right, I'm going to watch a video, I'm going to answer to a question. Right. I'm going to watch a video, I'm going to answer a question. I'm going to watch a video. Yeah, that, and that it gets begins, a bit repetitive. And it begins to kind of put you to sleep, yeah. And I guess it's, it sounds like when you've done this a few times, it comes naturally. So you'll you'll naturally put variety into your actions at the end of every module. But I guess when you're just starting to do this, it's worth going back and looking at it and saying, okay, these are all my actions. Is there enough variety in them? I am actually getting people to get up and move or do something different to speak to people, um, to reflect versus to to analyze, etc. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and so if you so the, the, if we look at those those actions actually one thing is worth saying that has come out naturally is those actions have always been very related to their own lives or their own business you're not setting them kind of for a career conversation you're not setting them an exercise that might be imagine tom is a manager in a in a in a business and tom has to have a difficult conversation with whatever you don't you that's not the type of exercise you do no uh, i mean we we don't believe in role play we believe in in people having real career conversations. So we say to them, you're not pretending at any point here. If you're talking about your career, you're talking about your career yeah. as much as you want to. And if you're asking somebody else about their career, you're asking them about their career. Um, so it, it is very real and, and grounded. We do get them to um, just give us case studies. That's about the closest we get where um, suddenly, you know, Phileas Fogg is um, an employee who's been with, you know, whatever company for 10 years. And, yeah, you know, so we'll get a description, but we know it's based on yeah. a real a person. A real person, they've just anonymized a bit, yeah. Yeah, and then we will discuss as a group, well, how might Claire handle this if she's mm. the manager and she has to have a career conversation with this person mm. that's the closest we'll get to any kind of simulation yeah because I, I, I my experience in training with, with when you've done role play etc is because it's not real you miss out the the shades of gray and the difficulties so often you get uh, often it ends up either being extreme so you know someone who's really so difficult it, it doesn't reflect real situation and you can't make any progress or it's too easy and someone will just be, you know, you'll ask the obvious questions and they'll kind of roll over and play along and it doesn't kind of work. It's only when you get a real situation that you un and that you know that you're able to go, oh, yeah, but, and and, and you get a proper, ch proper level of challenge. It's not either too difficult or too easy. It's the right level of, of complexity that reflects the real world. Yeah. And it's it's what you do as well. So if you know you get people to draw up their personas, it's not kind of well. Imagine that you run an e-commerce business selling jewelry. You know what would the persona be? Uh, yeah. It's like well, you have a business. <laughs> yeah. Think of your clients. Who's your ideal client? And you know. Draw yeah, because it is it is incredibly easy to draw up a persona for someone else's business that you don't know. <laughs> Because you just draw <laughs> gross stereotypes that all sound as if it would work brilliantly. It's only when you look at your your own business, you go, oh, this is hard work. And I'm not quite sure. And I have three different types. Which one do I pick? You the, you know, the subtleties only really come out when you're looking at the real world. OK, um, so that's that. So you're going through kind of module by module um, and and doing the actions at the end that are going to lead to the behavior change you were looking for when you when you drew that out how do you how do you get that to all add up you know so you're looking at the individuals do, do you do you do something to make sure that when when you add up all those actions and behavior changes it, it it comes to the end result is there some kind of sanity check on that well again it comes down to kind of what do they need to know to make this happen so if i give you as an example ours um so our confident career conversations training, they need to know what questions to ask. So, so we go through that. They need to know how to answer those tricky, you know, statements that employees make or, or tricky challenges. They know how to, they need to know how to set it up. So um, actually sat in an office with a one hour outlook calendar request is not the best way. 
So they need to think about how do I make this a great environment? How do I make this a trusted environment? How do I build rapport so the person is happy and think, believes I've got their true interests at heart? Um, and they need to know some philosophy around what do we mean by careers and career development? Because there are some myths around that that need dispelling. Um, and that's essentially how we break down our different mod modules. So we have one which is on let's talk careers. That's around the philosophy and the mindset and busting those myths. Um, we've got one around characteristics of effective career conversations. So how do you set it up? How do you cre create the right environment? We've got one around you know what we call a career conversation toolkit. That's essentially the questions to ask and how to structure the career conversation so you cover the right things and then we have career conversations in practice which is around those challenges all those you know questions that managers will ask which is things like uh yeah but what if they say they want to be promoted and i can't promote them or what if they say um that that, that uh they don't want to be developed uh, or what if you know all of those what ifs um so we we chunk it down like and that. And so when they've done each of those things, they've done all the things needed to prepare them. How do you then kind of throw them out into the real world? How do you kind of close the course that gets them to take the next step of translating their new learning into in, in, into a real world change? Um, thinking about how they can make it as simple as possible to have that conversation. So, yeah, rather than oh my goodness, I have to go and have a massive one hour or longer conversation about somebody's whole life, which is terrifying. And what if they ask me things I can't answer? It's actually breaking it down into, you know, one question you could ask somebody tomorrow that would just be a bit safer. Yeah. Right. What have you enjoyed about work today? Um, so we, we set up almost a seven day or 30 day career conversation right. challenge, which is just one small thing you can do each day that is around that subject just to make it a bit more com comfortable we also say don't pick your most challenging employee so a manager <laughs> yeah a manager will always have but the but what if what if what if yeah. don't don't start with them <laughs> start with the person that is going to be the easiest yeah. and most receptive give yourself some practice and build up your confidence yeah so rather than so they've, they've done this whole course and they've learned a whole load of stuff but rather than say, right now, go and do it all, you say, right, okay, day one, day two, day three, etc., or the first week or the first month, and do a little bit at a time so you're building up to that. So there's a there's always a section on how to how to put this into practice that makes it easy and chunked for them so they can they can manage it practically. Brilliant. Yeah, and if you have the beauty of an asynchronous online course, you can of course build that in. Mm. If if it's a live online program, then we don't often have access to them after they've finished right, the work. It's over and done, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're async, not... Okay, so async, you can have a, a section at the end where they're still going through it after 30 days, for example. Um, yeah. And they can come back and report on how it's how it's been and stuff like that. Yeah, or you could have a separate kind of email automation set up through Active Campaign that they sign up for voluntarily. Uh -huh. Um kind of go right you know well if you're ready to go why not sign up for seven day challenge five day challenge similar to what you would do from a marketing perspective but you do it but from doing that from implementation right. perspective very good very good and that can be really simple it's kind of no extra work once you've programmed it but it just triggers the interaction and you, they can begin to get feedback as well and stuff like that okay that's excellent okay so it sounds like we, we've kind of covered the core elements there is there anything else that you you'd say is is key to to getting results from a course you've got how you design it by taking the behavior change not just the knowledge the behavior change and you chunk it up you've got getting people behaving early on to to interact and to uh, um and then taking actions that that are real world ones and build up to the whole picture and then you get them going at the end anything anything else you would build into your courses to to make sure people are getting results from them. Yeah, I mean, I think the more that you can build a community that mm. can learn from each other, the better. Um, I'd say in our online uh, portal, we do that in the cohorts. Mm. In, in your stuff, you probably do it through private Facebook groups. Yeah. 
Um, and again, you can then have people that have been on the same program all at different times, but they're coming together and helping each other. Um, now, I know that community is always good for marketing, but actually from a learning perspective and an implementation perspective, it's really powerful. Mm. People, you know, one of the things about training courses, they will always say that people will learn more from each other in the breaks than they will from the person at the front of the room, which is not nice to hear, but <laughs> right. I, it, <laughs> it, it, it might be the, a little bit the reality. Yeah. So the more that you can create that network and community in other ways, um, then the better. And then it's more likely to stick and people are there supporting each other for the implementation piece. And I've always been really impressed by how much people are willing to help other people in these communities. Um, I, I remember when I first started running um, online courses that had a live component, um, I began to get a little bit worried because people were progressing at different rates through the program. And I remember thinking, oh, we're halfway through and some people are like almost finished and some people are just beginning. Will the people who are almost finished get bored with the online calls if we're if they're talking to people who are just starting and will but no they were really helpful they enjoyed helping the others with the things they'd already been through themselves so it worked it worked really well I think that's just most I, I'm guessing most people certainly my experience has been most people are very generous in terms of sharing what they've been through and, and, and helping others kind of catch up yeah, and I think that's an important point is that if you do have a live element to it, then you have to be really careful that people that have not managed to get as far through the online portal don't not come because they haven't done that content. Yeah, you don't want them kind of embarrassed or feeling they're behind, yeah. yeah. And we always say, you know, that doesn't matter. We don't care how you learn it. You can learn it by going through it yourself or you can learn it by hearing from somebody else that's gone through it. Mm. You know, it's as long as you get what you need from it, we don't mind how that happens. So, yeah, yeah you know, don't, don't not come just because you haven't, you know, got as far through the module. Done your lesson this week. Yeah, brilliant. Antoinette, that has been absolutely fantastic. There has been a ton in there for people to learn from as they create their first or just as likely as they're creating their third, fourth, fifth online course because there's a lot to learn there. I think you I think we should also be um, generous with ourselves as well in terms of not expecting our first course to have all these elements in so similar to you were saying for the 30-day plan that you produce at the end of the course where you introduce these things gradually we ought to do that ourselves when we're creating our online courses and and the nice thing is we can always go back to it and update it and add more to it and rejig it a yeah. bit it, it you know we don't have to get it all right the first time especially if we're doing it live um, because we can learn from that experience and then go back and update it before we, we release it. But uh, yeah. thank you so much for all of that. It's going to be incredibly useful for people watching. Um, and if you are watching and you are doing your first online course, come back to this video. You don't, as I say, you don't have to learn it all at once. Keep coming back, learning a bit more at a time, and uh, and you'll get a lot out of it. And you, more importantly, the people taking your courses will get better results, so it's good for them, which means they'll come back to you and they'll recommend you, which is better for you. And I think to your point, which you would always say, Ian, just ask for feedback. Just keep asking them for feedback. Ask them what works. And, you know, as you say, once it's there, you can just keep yeah. refining it and improving it. Yeah, I don't feel as if you have to be perfect on all of this. Nobody's expecting it, especially now. I think now is a great time to be doing this stuff because people know that, that the world is, is, is in a weird place at the minute. People are not expecting perfection out of the door. So it's a great chance to get something out and learn from it and keep improving it. Antoinette, once again, thank you very, very much. And uh, see everyone again soon. All right. Take care.